The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, royal taste from Charles I to Charles III. Will the death of Queen Elizabeth II and King Charles III's proclamation prompt a new era of royal patronage? Plus, the energy crisis hits museums and heritage and Henry Fuseli's gothic masterwork, The Nightmare. I speak to the former surveyor of the Queen's pictures, Desmond Shaw Taylor, about the royal collection, Queen Elizabeth II and King Charles III's taste in art, and how the modern era compares to the past in terms of the royal patronage of visual art. As the lights in museums and on monuments are turned off across Europe, UK institutions are facing soaring energy bills that could prove to be an existential threat. Lisa Ollerhead of the Association of Independent Museums discusses how they can respond. And this episode's work of the week is The Nightmare by Henry Fuseli, the Swiss-British artist's most famous work, two versions of which are in the new Fuseli show at the Musée Jacquemart André in Paris. Before all that, you can still take advantage of our latest subscription offer. If you have a friend or family member who's going to study art, art history or another subject this year, why not buy them a gift student subscription to the art newspaper from just £25 per year? Visit our website, click subscriptions and select student subscription. Do also subscribe to this podcast and our sister podcast, A Brush With, wherever you're listening. Now, since Queen Elizabeth II died on the 8th of September, comments have inevitably been full of tributes to a life of service to Britain and the Commonwealth. When turning to her existence beyond royal duties, they've tended to focus on her love of the outdoors and pursuits like horse racing rather than her cultural tastes and passions. So, to what extent did the visual arts appeal to her? And how did royal patronage in the Second Elizabethan Age relate to the golden periods of collecting by English and British monarchs of the past? In contrast to Elizabeth, the new king, Charles III has been very vocal about his interest and taste in art and visual culture more widely. So can we expect any shifts in royal patronage in the coming years? I spoke to Desmond Shaw Taylor, who was surveyor of the Queen's pictures in the Royal Collection between 2004 and 2020, about art and the British royal family. Desmond, you were surveyor of the Queen's pictures for a number of years. Can you tell us about that role? What did it entail? Uh, Yes, that's an ancient role founded by... Charles I, and it's responsible for looking after the entire collection of painting in the Royal Collection. So that's not just in any particular palace, it's spread all over everywhere. So if it was a museum, it would be like chief curator of paintings. And could you give us a flavour of the scope of the Royal Collection, the number of paintings and prints and drawings, etc.? Well, the paintings, about 7,000, then two to 3,000 miniatures, don't even go there when it comes to drawings which were which were <laughs> only distant, not my responsibility, uncountable and including 600 drawings by Leonardo da Vinci. Then the uh, decorative arts, the furniture, jewellery, porcelain, Fabergé. It's quite a lot to compass the scale of the collection. And remember that it's everything everywhere in royal residences. That's extraordinary. I wanted to ask about the sort of connection you would have with members of the royal family in that role. Was there sort of almost daily liaison? Because of course you've got all manner of things going on around the royal household, state visits and so on. But you've also got the responsibility of the Queen's Gallery, Holyrood House, these other official sort of public spaces where people could actually come and see the royal collection. So tell me about that sort of balance in the role. Yes, I mean, I think that of course there were contacts. The team on a very large team and running the royal collection as a whole had served the members of the royal family and the royal household but i think it would be fair to say that the majority of our activity was not directly connected it was concerned with the understanding and preservation of the collection so sort of quietly working away in a conservation studio somewhere and as you say the presentation of the collection to the public in the state apartments, which are open to the public, and um, in the Queen's galleries. There's a very considerable not-for-profit commercial aspect of the operation. It manages the opening of Windsor Castle and Buckingham Palace during the summer opening period, Holyrood Palace. So it's got a very, very considerable visitor attraction management side to its activities. In terms of the collection itself, 
Obviously, one of the most extraordinary things about it is that it remains intact as a royal collection. When one thinks of the great collections in Europe, like at the one at the Louvre and the one at the Prado, for instance, those were once royal collections that have been added to, etc. But I suppose one of the most unique things is it is still a royal collection. Can you say something about that? How unique is it now in Europe and the world? Actually, that word unique is unusually quite correct. <laughs> it is exactly that. All the European comparables have, as you say, become not just national museums, but in the case of former principalities in Germany or somewhere, regional museums, the Alta Pinacotheca or whatever it might be. So yes, that is um, exceptional. And I think it has a sort of wonderfully positive side, which is that you can visit Windsor Castle and see the art that was, in a sense, designed to go at Windsor Castle, in a way almost doing the thing which it was always designed to do with that sort of perfect balance of decorative arts and paintings. But of course, it also has challenges because the, the sort of professional role that I was involved in, my colleagues were, are, are still involved in, it's a lot simpler if it's all in one nice purpose-built building uh, rather than being you know, scattered all over uh, the country. Can you just give us a few, I know this is going to be very hard, a few of the kind of great pictures that are still in the Royal Collection across time, I guess, but just some of those extraordinary highlights, because they are some of the greatest pictures ever made. <laughs> but that is absolutely true. And I suppose if the big players, the Charles I and the Stuarts, some of the greatest of those, I'm afraid, were sold by Cromwell, but there are still absolutely wonderful, mostly Italian Renaissance paintings. So, for example, I mean, a sort of personal favourite is An Adoration of the Shepherds by Jacopo Bassano, the sort of wonderful Venetian uh, landscape, very rustic landscape. So that's Charles I. Then, I suppose, the next big highlight might be George III, who acquired this amazing collection of, uh, for him, modern Venetian painting, including 50 Canalettos. So there are an extraordinary range of Canalettos, but including these very kind of free, painterly, rather kind of very expressive sort of early landscape. So he's another big player. I suppose the next big player will be George IV acquiring Dutch painting. And so let's pick at random the Rembrandt shipbuilder and his wife, you know, one of the most sort of vivid depictions of an elderly couple in, in the history of art. One of the things I'm always interested in is is the role of the royal household in commissioning. Of course, we know that the greatest artists were court artists, that the ultimate for a major painter would be to make art for royal households across Europe. One thinks of Titian and so on. Of course, therefore, your predecessors as surveyors would have had a commissioning role, wouldn't they? Oddly enough, it varies. The surveyor role was Never quite as grand as that, actually. I think uh, often it was a sort of humble drudge picking up the pieces after somebody else had done the commissioning or the advising on the acquisition of old masters. So it slightly varies through time, but I, that's my general impression of how the role has played out. In terms of the sort of royal patronage of the arts then in the modern era, I'm thinking particularly after the invention of photography and so on. To what extent is there a shift? Because obviously there are those massive collecting households with court artists and so on. When does it become, if you like, a modern kind of approach? And is it sort of coinciding with the role of museums, for instance? Is there a sort of neat moment where there's a big shift in that kind of structure of the collection? Yes, probably a couple of shifts. I mean, I think that during the 19th century, there's a very considerable shift in the type of art which Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, two very, very cultured people, were collecting, and the type of art which we would now expect to read about in our survey history of, of European painting. And that was a big step. They basically liked what I think we might now call salon painting, and they're not interested in Millet or Monet or Degas or the mainstream modernists or what we now decide are mainstream modern. So I think that's a big jump. And then I think the next sort of major step change would be, I suppose, sometime around corresponding with the First World War, when there's an acknowledgement that the kind of awe-inspiring magnificence of royalty sort of isn't going to fly anymore. And there are major public collections which have taken over the role of perhaps you might say, ambitious acquisition and commissioning. And the monarchy is doing something different. So I think there are sort of two-step changes, really. So 
in that context then, one of the things I'm really conscious of is we've heard a lot about the late Queen's interest in, for instance, horse racing. We know she was a deeply passionate lover of horses and and racing. Lots of people on the radio and TV talking about this. I don't think I've heard a single item where they've talked about her cultural interests. Was this kind of a policy? Is this something that we weren't meant to hear about? Or is it just that it simply wasn't a passion? I think the latter. I mean, if we're considering, you know, the, the Queen's personal preferences, I don't think there would be any doubt and you know the the world I think knows the Queen pretty well uh, <laughs> that she's much keener on racehorses and nature out of doors than cultural activities. I think that there is a difference between that and what her role might be as a monarch in relation to the royal collection. But I think if you if you're just looking personal preferences, that's I think reasonably clear. And you know, by the way, no bad thing if you do a correlation of great monarch collectors and great monarchs, you get quite an inverse <laughs> correlation. <laughs> you know, collecting is it's quite a kind of greedy thing if you do it well, if you see what I mean. That's really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, yeah, one thinks Philip IV, Charles I, George IV, etc. These are people that are, are famed for their weakness as monarchs and their strength as art collectors. Yes, exactly. And I mean, I'm, I, I don't want to say that as a categorical rule because it just sort of feels <laughs> like I'm rather undermining the source of the great collection that I had was privileged to work with. And I wouldn't say, certainly not, you know, because somebody is cultured, they must be a bad king. But there is something, I think, about collecting, which isn't just about love of art. You want it for yourself. It's got quite a graspy side. Did you then, to any extent, get a flavour for the Queen's personal taste? And did she ever express to you a particular love of paintings in the collection or or things that she wanted to have near her or anything like that? Oh, yes, completely. And then it was sort of quite widely known what she liked. And in particular, the great Dutch paintings collected by uh, George IV were were clear personal favourites. I mean, she particularly liked a, a painting by Terbor called The Letter Reader. Fantastic choice. I mean, most beautiful exquisitely painted this amazing silk dress but also sort of charming intimate slightly um, enigmatic depiction of uh, two ladies one's reading to the other so really 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 beautiful painting and I think I would have said that kind of love a very lucid clear realism that you see in um, Dutch painting but also in some 18th century paintings so Leotard pastels for example mm. Stubbs paintings so, okay you might say well that's that's, that's easy the little horses but they're also painted with this wonderful lucidity and luminosity also the uh, Gainsborough's and Canaletto's figure quite prominently so I think I felt like I could sort of roughly guess what the Queen liked and what she would have like less. One of the things I don't know about is to what extent could members of the royal family say I would like this painting hung in this room please to you or was there a much more formal process if you like behind it all? No I mean they, they could exactly as you say. I became surveyor relatively late in the reign so things were sort of roughly in their right place already. I was more aware of general desire that they shouldn't be moved around than a desire to move them in the first place, if you see what I mean. Let's talk about King Charles III then. He, in contrast to the Queen, has had a very public expression of his taste in art. I am aware of that through speeches and, of course, through the Prince's Drawing School, which is a sort of notable educational institution. Was there a much more active discussion with him, as one would imagine, than there was with other members of the royal family? First of all, absolutely, as you say, hugely, hugely engaged. I mean, to a really quite remarkable extent. But I think it's very important, again, to draw this distinction between the sort of collector instinct and a love of or an, an, an interest in art. King Charles III, Prince of Wales as, as he was, was a, a huge supporter of artistic education and artistic endeavour. That was, is, remain a, a huge passion, which was there for all to see. I mean, for example, when we did an exhibition at the Buckingham Palace Summer Open to celebrate his 70th birthday, it was sort of centred around these three ventures of encouraging art, which he, which he had set up. The Turquoise Mountain, which is the preservation of traditional skills in war-torn areas, particularly Afghanistan, the School of Traditional Art and the Royal Drawing School, the, the third. So those three charities uh, set up by His Royal Highness were sort of represented. Now, none of those involved any kind of collecting. They were all to do with just encouraging 
and facilitating, I suppose, is the word. And I think that means, I think, that we're not looking at or expecting, I wouldn't have thought, a kind of golden age of George IV just saying, I wonder how much every Dutch painting that comes up for sale and I don't care how much it costs. It, it's, it's not going to happen like that, nor should it. I mean, I think that's the whole point about the First World War. Is that the, the game is completely different. And um, even things like monarchs since then don't build themselves grand new palaces. They use the old palaces. In the old days, people used sort of dump the previous collection that they had inherited in the old sort of palaces, the drafty cold ones, um, <laughs> built themselves nice new houses and commissioned a whole new swathe of, of stuff to hang on the walls and furnish the rooms. That doesn't happen anymore. For example, the Prince of Wales furnished the uh, High Grove almost entirely with things which were taken out of store from the holdings of the royal collection. So he had this sense of, we must, you know, use the material that the collection already contains. One of the things that's been reported is that both the Duke of Edinburgh, the Queen's uh, late husband, and the Queen Mother, her mother, had private collections. And I, I was wondering how those dovetailed with the royal collection. Did you, as surveyor of the Queen's pictures, deal with those collections at all, as in even sort of relating to the hang in the residences like Balmoral or Sandringham, for instance? No, but um, in some of the mechanics of, of inventory checking, simply recording the existence of those collections and electronically databasing them were undertaken by the Royal Collection. So I kind of knew what was in them. Actually, a lot more interesting things than you would think given the sort of basic headline characterization of the Queen being more interested in horses than art, actually rather wonderful things. Lots and lots of Edward Seagoes and some extraordinary gifts, actually some extraordinarily good Australian modernist works, Sidney Nolan, Drysdale. It's a bit of a treasure trove, you know, in, in that respect. So definitely let's qualify the sort of view of n n not interested at all. I mean, really quite quite seriously. But these works are fairly modest dimensions, they are private in that sense as well as in that they were owned privately. They're for private spaces. Of course, there will be one pretty major art commission that we know will happen, which, of course, will be a coronation portrait. I can't imagine there wouldn't be one. But that seems to me that even though, as you say, the sort of era of grand commissions is over or grand collecting is over, still the new king can make a statement, can he not, with the image he decides to project when his coronation happens, we think, next year. Yes, and unquestionably will. It's a tough old task, though, because the tradition of painting like that, it's still going, <laughs> but it's, it's perhaps declined a little bit from the glory days of Sargent or Sir Thomas Lawrence. And I think, you know, for example, that the use of painted imagery as part of, I don't know, the image projection of the reign of the late Queen Elizabeth II, painted portraiture played a pretty small part. I mean, there are probably a hundred images of Queen Victoria in the royal collection. That's oil painting alone, including ceremonies and so on. You'd be lucky to find ten of, you know, of Queen Elizabeth II. So that, that completely, not vanished, but really reduced as a, as a means of, of you know, expressing the idea of in the ceremonies of kingship. But of course, because its place was taken by other media. Exactly. And I suppose the Queen's Association, you know, she is the queen of the media age. We've heard that a lot over the last week or so, you know, that she is the era of television, the era of mass media, etc. But one wonders, because of Charles's conviction and commitment to, as you say, educational tools, he's very passionate about traditional teaching of drawing. One wonders if he will go for a, a painted portrait or a drawing because of that conviction. I don't know what you think. Uh, yes, and, and, and he already has done. I mean, he, he's commissioned now three series, at least, and maybe another one in the, in the pipeline that, <laughs> since my retirement, but uh, dealing, recording people who were involved in the momentous events of the Second World War. So the airmen, the, the D-Day landers and, and Holocaust survivors. And uh, these are all painted and they are really fascinating. I mean, each one given to a different painter, often connected to the Royal Drawing School. Uh, so a sort of huge variety of different uh, painters approaching the task, but and also obviously a huge variety of, of survivors of those um, events. So in a sense, it's already, it's already happening. But these are modest scaled portraits 
I won't say ordinary people because they're completely extraordinary people, but people extraordinary by their experiences, not by you know rank. Uh, so I would expect that interest, of course, to continue. But I feel that, that that's quite a different thing from saying, let's have lots of full lengths, you know, dressed in the robes of the Order of the Garter. Those commissions will typically, I think, come from outside. Certainly that, that was what occurred to, during the last reign, that you know, institutions will request a sitting in order that they can have a state portrait or a formal portrait for the town hall or the embassy or whatever it might be. Well, Desmond, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you. You can read more about Queen Elizabeth II, Charles III and the Royal Collection at theartnewspaper.com and on our app for Android and iOS, which you can download from Google Play and the App Store. Coming up, the energy crisis bites in museums and Henry Fuseli's The Nightmare. But first, here's this week's news bulletin. Scientific investigations of Johannes Vermeer's The Milkmaid at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam have revealed what the museum describes as startling discoveries about the mysterious artist's methods. Using advanced techniques, conservators found a sketch of a wooden jug holder, several hanging ceramic jugs and a fire basket, which Vermeer painted over. It's long been assumed that the artist produced his small surviving oeuvre, just 35 accepted works, very slowly and working with great precision. But the museum says that the sketched underpainting shows clearly that Vermeer first quickly painted the scene in light and dark tones before developing the detail. Research on the milkmaid has been taken in conjunction with what will be the largest Vermeer exhibition ever held, which opens at the Rijksmuseum on the 10th of February 2023. Around 30 works from the collection of the late CBS founder William S. Paley, which have been on loan to the Museum of Modern Art in New York since his death in 1990, will come to auction at Sotheby's this autumn, the museum has announced. Top lots include pieces by Pablo Picasso, Pierre-Auguste Renoir and Francis Bacon. They were lent to MoMA with the understanding that the museum and Paley's foundation could determine how the works could be best used to serve the public and changing needs of the institution. To that end, MoMA says that the sales proceeds will help establish an endowment for digital media and technology. The artist Glenn Brown will open a museum of his own work in London during Freeze Week in October. Brown will show paintings, sculptures and drawings that he's kept from across his career in a house in Bentinck Mews in Marylebone in central London. In time, he'll bring them together with works by historic artists in his private collection, including the Bolognese Gandolfi brothers and the Dutch master Abraham Blomart. Brown has funded the purchase and restoration of the building and will pay for the running costs of the new museum himself. He says that while the museum, which is called the Brown Collection, might appear to be an egotistical thing to do, it's an act to try and enhance communication, not his ego. Brown is the guest on the 50th episode of our sister podcast, A Brush With, which you can download wherever you're listening now. You can read all these stories and much more on the website or the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This September, Christie's New York presents Asian Art Week featuring imperial porcelain from China, Himalayan bronzes, samurai armour and modern South Asian artists. Experience a range of highlights from important and institutional collections, including the John C. and Susan L. Huntington collection, the T. Eugene Worrell collection and the collection of Romy Lamber. Visit christies.com slash Asian Art Week for more. Welcome back. Now, the energy crisis is having a huge impact on cultural institutions and heritage across Europe. The mayor of Paris, Anne Hidalgo, this week announced that the lights on all municipal buildings will be turned off at 10pm and the Eiffel Tower will be plunged into darkness at a quarter to midnight. And in the UK, the energy crisis is prompting alarm in homes, businesses and cultural institutions. At the moment that the news of the Queen's worsening health emerged, British MPs were debating an emergency package to address soaring energy bills. The new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, announced a plan that means a typical household will pay no more than £2,500 a year for energy for the two years from October. On Wednesday, the government confirmed that businesses and institutions will get help with energy bills from October too, and that that scheme will run until at least March 2023. 
To give a flavour of the scale of the rises, the Catalyst Science Discovery Centre and Museum in Widnes in northern England has said that it would see its bills increase by 353% this winter, from £9,700 to £44,000. Apply those proportions to the energy bills of national museums and the figures are eye-watering. In 2021-22, to 22, Tate, with its two London sites plus Liverpool and St Ives, spent £5.5 million on energy. The British Museum spent £2.1 million, the Victoria and Albert Museum £1.5 million and the National Gallery £1.3 million. Alongside the lingering effects of the pandemic, with visitors still not at pre-Covid levels and high inflation, it represents an unprecedented perfect storm and a potential existential crisis for some institutions. I spoke to Lisa Ollerhead, the Director of the Association of Independent Museums in the UK, which is conducting a survey of the effects of the crisis on museums about the situation. Lisa, to begin with, can you just tell me how are museums doing generally at the moment? We've just come out of the pandemic, visitor numbers are down, etc. So how would you assess the health of museums even before the energy crisis? I think even before the energy crisis, we knew that a lot of museums were still having quite a bit of trouble. We knew that visitor numbers are recovering in different ways across the country, and particularly with museums that have a lot of international visitors, we knew that that was going to be more difficult for them. There are reasons for optimism. We've heard from a number of our members that their visitor numbers have bounced back really well over the spring and summer. We are hearing anecdotally from some members that their spend per head uh, for visitors is up, which is, is really good news. But I would say it is a tired sector. People are still recovering and uh, felt that it's really, people are still recovering and uh, felt that this has come along at a, a really difficult time when they were just getting back on their feet. Mm, Indeed. Um, Before we go any further, tell us who are your members? You mentioned your members there. Yeah, sure. So I work for the Association of Independent Museums. We are a UK wide membership organisation. We have nearly 1300 members, about a thousand of those are institutional members. So museums and heritage organisations. Um, By independent, we mean organisations that don't rely on others for their decision making or for their funding mostly. So most, but not all of our members are charities which have uh, independent boards of trustees making their decisions and uh, running their their funding. And uh, about two thirds of our members are in our small museums category. So they have fewer than 20,000 visitors a year. And then the rest are a mix of of, uh, from some of the biggest civic museums in the country, big trusts, right down to small museums that are perhaps non-accredited by the Arts Council and maybe open for a few hours a week on weekends and uh, volunteer run. Now, you have a bit of background in terms of dealing with museums in crisis, because I believe that you were at the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport before and actually worked on the Culture Recovery Fund, which was this enormous package which actually got museums through the pandemic. Can you say something about your experiences then? Yeah, sure. Uh, So I worked for DCMS for about five years as head of museums policy and um, worked on a number of things there. So the Mendoza Review, the Museum Estates and Development Fund and the Culture Recovery Fund, as you've said. Uh, So I led on the repayable finance part of the Culture Recovery Fund. And I also spent a couple of months as the um, interim head of the Secretariat in DCMS and it was a very difficult time. It was a very pressured time. We were working very closely with the the funding bodies, so the Arts Council, National Lottery Heritage Fund, Historic England and BFI, British Film Institute. Um, And we knew, of course, that it was a very pressured time for all of the organisations that we were working with and hoping to get funding to. And that was really what was driving all of the work within DCMS was that awareness amongst officials and, of course, of ministers of exactly what the challenges were around the sector and how much that help was was desperately needed to keep organisations from going under. And before we come on to talking about energy specifically, I wanted to talk about to what extent did that stretch the DCMS itself? I'm really interested in, of course, at that time, every single government department was crying out to the Treasury to say, help me now. To what extent was the DCMS pushed to its limits by that experience? 
I would say that every government department was was pushed to its limits. It was obviously a countrywide, global, generational crisis. And every single department, I think, was all hands on deck. Certainly in DCMS, there was lots of moving people around. There was standing up new teams to coordinate things in the centre. There was a lot of working with Treasury. It was very long hours and long days for many long months. But again, I think we all recognised that that was what was happening within our sectors that we look after and and work with. And it was a pressured time. So energy crisis, you're in the process of sending out to your members a survey, right? But what are you asking in that survey? So we are doing a SNAP survey. It opened last week and it is open for about another week. It's not just open to members. So please do have a look at the AIM website and the AIM Twitter, we're at AIM Museums. If you are a museum or heritage organisation and you feel you might be able to answer that survey. Um, I know from my experience at DCMS how important it is to have specific data and evidence about exactly what's going on in the sector because that is what helps convince government departments and the Treasury and show ministers what's going on and why assistance is needed. So we are asking about how business was over the summer, how income was and how visitor numbers were compared to projections or or hopes. We are asking about utilities and uh, and energy and we are really trying to understand. We know a lot of organisations are still on fixes and are perhaps not being directly affected yet by energy bills. So uh, we're trying to get an idea of what those numbers are, what the people who aren't on fixes, who are out looking for new contracts, how much their bills are going up by, what proportion energy was of their their turnover in 2019 2020 compared to what it's going to be on any new bill with the increased prices and we are looking at what kind of changes organizations might be looking at making with in terms of for instance if they're going to close galleries if they're going to shorten opening hours if they're looking at staff restructures and redundancies we want to really understand how organizations are being affected and also how organisations are planning to tackle those impacts. And we're asking people what support they need. So we are thinking about various kinds of support. We know some of the kinds of support that are on the minds of people in DCMS and in government. And we are wanting to understand particularly of the non-CRF COVID interventions such as VAT cuts and business rates relief, what kind of impact similar interventions might have on the utilities. So in terms of energy bills, there's not enormous amounts of data out there, actually, but there are some. For instance, there's this, I think, the kind of headline figure in a way. There's this Science and Discovery Centre in Widnes in Cheshire, northern England. And as I said in the intro to this section, they have said that their bills have gone up from 9,000 to 44,000. Is that the sort of figures that you're hearing about across the board? Because that seems to me to be really potentially existential crisis for museums. Yes. So uh, a lot of the the numbers that we're hearing at the moment, it is quite anecdotal, hence why we're doing our survey to try and get a wider sample and understand more of what's going on. But yeah, I would say multiples of three, four times what bills used to be is the, the kind of numbers we're hearing. Right. And in terms of what the government have already said about it, we know that they've made statements about businesses and institutions. Have they actually said anything specifically about cultural institutions, museums, etc.? Not about cultural institutions or museums that that I think we are aware of. Obviously, there was the hopefully very positive announcement made on Thursday and then due to the Queen passing away, it hasn't been possible to hear more details about that. So we are still waiting to understand how those promises will be implemented and what it will mean for museums and heritage and and cultural institutions. What we did see in the early reporting was that there will hopefully be an opportunity 
to identify museums and culture as vulnerable sectors which need support beyond the initial six months that was announced last week. But we are still waiting for the detail. And of course, while we are waiting for the detail, individual organisations are not able to understand what it means for them personally. So um, I think there is still quite a lot to to come out and to work through before we can really know what those announcements mean and um, what other support might be required. Is it sort of essential for AIM and the Museum Association to lobby government together? I'm wondering how, if you like, the museum sector can best lobby to government to, to ask for support. And is that about a kind of sort of a singular force, if you like, of the museum sector all lobbying at once? Or how does it work? Yeah, I think it is really important for all of the sector bodies to work together. And we do do that. We work closely with the Museums Association, with uh, NMDC, the National Museum Directors Council, with the Art Fund, with a number of other bodies. We are speaking regularly and we speak regularly as a group to funders and to government as well. I think it's really important that we have a set of clear coherent asks that we have all agreed is the best for the sector as a whole so for instance NMDC represent a lot of the nationals but we work with them and we bring in the perspective of the the smaller museums it was very much something that happened during Covid was that there were individual conversations going on about different kinds of museums and and types of museums but there was also a lot of talking between DCMS and the sector bodies as a group and everybody wanted the same thing which is to support the sector and it's really important for that I think that as sector bodies we do have one ask and that we are not trying to go off and make side deals or, or anything like that with government we are working together and we are all thinking about how to help the sector as a whole when it comes to energy it strikes me that museums are not necessarily going to be the most efficient buildings many of them are very old they are multiple rooms sometimes they are very big rooms we know very well that even the most famous museums in britain museums like the british museum are struggling with maintenance right now so are you advising your members on how they can be more energy efficient is that a factor that you see as part of your role or is it very much about policy and other things yeah so aim as an organization is very focused on the pragmatic advice and support that we can give our members so we are very much thinking about what we can do to advise members on how they can reduce their energy consumption and how they can make those kinds of changes. I think the challenges around that, and you're entirely right, many museum buildings are really quite difficult, whether it's because they are listed, because they do have unmet maintenance needs and maintenance backlogs, or whether it is because they've got collections in them that need to be kept in particular environmental conditions. It is a very challenging time to have a museum building and a collection to care for. But the challenges around that are that it can be difficult to get funding for that kind of work, upgrading services and uh, enabling more efficient energy use. We are also thinking about the, the timings of that. So winter gas bills, uh, increased prices are going to be landing on mats over the next few months. And it's whether those kinds of changes can be made in time to really have an effect. I think that's it's more of a medium term help, I think, but it is something that we very much want to support our, our members with. Absolutely. There's this other factor, which is, of course, we want museums to continue operating because we want to go there and look at their amazing objects. However, there's also this other very clear message that we're reading in the press, which is that museums are going to be a place where people will go to keep warm. I mean, it sounds astonishing in one of the richest countries in the world, but it seems like libraries and museums are going to be playing a very important role in keeping British people warm this winter. Is that something you're hearing from your members and therefore are you urging them again that it is vital that they remain open and provide for their publics in this way? 
We're definitely hearing from a lot of our members that they are feeling that responsibility. Museums see themselves as civic spaces. They are community spaces and they want to be able to offer that to people that if people are struggling at home, if they are cold at home, they will be able to come in and and find a warm welcome in their local museum. But it is a big challenge obviously, for those museums to pay their own bills and to keep themselves warm. And they need support for that. And that is something that we are really keen, especially once we've got our survey results and and we are able to show that evidence about the impact across the, the sector. We would want to have those conversations with government, with public funders, with philanthropic funders to say, you know, look, museums really want to be doing this. They are ready to do this in terms of what they see their role as and how they want to be helping their communities. But if they can't pay their own energy bills, then they can't be able to do that. So it's something that a lot of funders, it's not very glamorous to pay an electric bill, but that is the support that a lot of museums need if they are going to be able to do that community work. Lastly, one of the things that we're hearing from Europe is that, for instance, in Paris, all the monuments are being turned off after 10pm, all the lights for the monuments are being turned off. These sorts of cultural and heritage spaces, they're beacons of communities as well, aren't they? Are you advising your, your members to turn the lights off to save energy in that way? I don't think that's something we are advising our members on, to be honest. I think it's something that we would say to our members to, they are the ones who know their communities, they are the ones who know the people who live around them and that's a decision that that they can take is that a role that they play i think generally speaking even before the the energy crisis we would say that energy use should be responsible and leaving lights on is not necessarily that but certainly if a place has got such a symbolic importance to its community that people want to see it lit up then that's something that they should be thinking about within their own circumstances Well, Lisa, it's a fast moving story. I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more from you in coming weeks. But thank you for joining us for now. Thank you very much. You can find out more about the Association of Independent Museums survey at its website. That's aim-museums.co.uk. So aim-museums.co.uk. And that Twitter handle again is at AI Museums. That's at AI Museums. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. The exhibition Fuseli, The Realm of Dreams and the Fantastic opens today, 16th of September, at the Musée Jacquemart André in Paris. It's dedicated to the Swiss-born British artist Henry Fuseli, or Johann Heinrich Fuseli, as he was christened, and features two versions of his most famous work, The Nightmare. I spoke to the show's curator, Christopher Baker, about this extraordinary composition. Christopher, before we come to talk about the work itself... At what stage in his career was Fuseli when he made this painting? He was actually, in many ways, in the middle of his career because he'd actually started out as a man with literary ambitions rather than painterly ambitions. He was born in 1741, died in 1825, and the great nightmare, the extraordinary nightmare, and all the other nightmares, two of which we have in the exhibition, really date from the 1780s onwards. He was born in Zurich. He came from an artistic family. His father was a painter. Amazingly, extraordinarily, he trained initially as a priest. And I don't think he was very happy about that because he certainly wasn't a pious figure. But he did have a very, very thorough literary education and learned about an extraordinary range of European literature from from the classics to Dante, Shakespeare, etc., etc., and got passionate about the world of letters. And he travelled to London initially, hoping to become a great writer. And he was connected with Winkelmann. He went off to Paris to meet Rousseau. But he wasn't really getting anywhere. He wasn't getting any traction as a writer. And um, there was a key moment in his career when he met Joshua Reynolds. And Sir Joshua Reynolds, or the future president of the Royal Academy, said, probably to get rid of of Fuseli, because Fuseli was a thoroughly annoying man, your drawings are wonderful. How long have you spent in Italy? And he hadn't been to Italy. He hadn't yet been to Italy. And Fuseli clearly thought this was a key moment, and he was actually going to change his ambitions and move from being a literary figure to becoming a great painter. And he goes off to Italy, has a fabulous time in Rome, a self-taught period in Rome, really, 
is passionate about classical art, um, sculpture, idolizes Michelangelo, and then comes back to London. And it's at that moment that this extraordinary, provocative, inventive man wants to create a sensation. He actually wants to make a mark, I think, in the London art world. And in 1781-2, he does that with his first version of The Nightmare. And it's a picture the likes of which nobody has ever seen before. Some people think he's a genius. Some people think he's depraved. But he's talked about. That's the key thing. He's not just famous. He becomes instantly infamous, I think, actually. Can you describe the painting? Because people will probably know this picture, even if they don't know they know it. Absolutely. The first version is in Detroit. We have two other versions in the show. And um, first of all, it's a dark chamber. It's darkness. And that's fundamental. I don't think ever at any point in his career did Fusley paint a sunlit picture. And there is, it's a private, luxurious chamber. And there's a young, beautiful woman lying on a couch, unconscious, with her arm hanging down by the side of the couch, exhausted, clearly. And there are some deeply disturbing, revolting intrusions into her private space, into her room. Seated above her is what's called an incubus, a small demon. And also over to the left of the composition, curtains are opened up and there is a nightmare, the head of a horse coming in. And this is a nightmarish vision. She has been, one can only imagine, attacked in the night. It's a highly eroticized image. It's an image which is deeply distasteful, I have to say, from a 21st century perspective. And is actually still rather shocking today and in the 1780s was unbelievable for many people. Can you tell me something about the sort of intellectual environment around this? Because what I'm really interested in was Fusley tapping into a very contemporary concern here or is this a kind of an outlandish statement that didn't tap into wider concerns at all? I think he's actually cleverly doing both. He's a highly intellectual, well-informed, well-read artist and he's doing two things. He's tapping into the contemporary taste for the Gothic, for horror, for the frisson of terror, if you like, and the spectacle and the entertainment that comes with that. I know that sounds like a weird thing to say, bearing in mind the, the deeply unpleasant nature of the imagery. So there's that going on. But at the same moment, in the second half of the 18th century, there is a growing serious interest in the unconscious, in the dream world, in the supernatural. People are writing dream diaries. It becomes an area of serious scholarly research, really. There's great interest in what the ancients wrote about dreams as well. So you've got all that going on at the same time. But Primarily, I think the the key motivation here is his desire to shock and be talked about and to become a successful artist as well. The other thing that's really interesting about this is so much of his work is literary because of his training based upon specific texts. And as far as we know, there is no specific text for this. So what you've got here is you've got Fusley becoming not only painter, but author at the same moment as well. And that's fascinating because he had started off trying to be a great man of letters and that hadn't worked out. But the two careers collide in this seminal picture. What about its artistic sources? Because as you say, he went to Italy. It was this sort of extremely important formative moment. And is it right that Italian classical sculpture sort of informs it or are we certain of those sources? I think there's some of that there certainly so he is aware of his classical heritage he's actually more interested than anything in mannerism it has to be said and that seems to me to inform very much the the type of the female figure we have here the very sort of elongated sort of almost unbelievable figure really he's very interested in This is a very simplistic way of putting it, but supermen and superwomen. So his women are very languorous, very tall, and fit in with that mannerist sort of mode of thinking about the human form. And similarly, when he paints men and draws men, they're all sort of muscular, pneumatic superheroes, really. And so I think actually it's it's probably more mannerism that we're looking at here than anything else. Although having said that, the particular formulation in the dark chamber with these monstrous intrusions is entirely him. It is new. It is exciting. The interpretations of this painting are many. Do you have a particular interpretation that you think hits the nail on the head or are they too numerous and each too plausible to have a real hard and fast story of this painting if you like that there are you're absolutely right there are many many interpretations i think therein lies the power of the picture whose is the nightmare is it this woman's 
Is it ours? It's a type of image that rapidly entered the public consciousness. And it's the type of image that you could project onto it, whatever narrative you wanted. I think that that's particularly important. And that has been subsequently the case. I mean, it's been reused endlessly for very very serious works of art and very ridiculous works of art. Um, I don't know that there is a single reliable interpretation. I mean, the, what, one of the interesting arguments is that the, the Detroit version, which is the first one, as opposed to the one we've got in the show, which comes later, has on the back an unfinished portrait of a woman on the back of the canvas. And is that indeed a woman that he fell in love with who, and it was a relationship that could not be consummated? So that's one idea, which is a compelling idea, but it's too neat a narrative. Yeah. That's too neat. I think there's something else going on here. In fact, many other things going on here. It is above all about sensation. It's about entertainment. It's about the pleasure that can come from horror, which is what he's tapping into. I wanted to talk about its legacy because one thing about this picture is, of course, so many sensational contemporary works then fall away very quickly. But one of the things about this thing is it, it's just repeatedly reinvented for new ages, right? Exactly right. And there are, there are particular technical reasons for that, actually. Very smartly, he knew the power of printmaking. Not everybody who knows this image actually saw the painting or indeed the versions, the, the terrific versions we've got in, in the show, actually in exhibitions. But the prints became widely available. And in fact, the 1810 version we, from a private European collection we've got in the Paris show, that's the one that had most prints produced after it. And they were disseminated everywhere. So I think that is fundamental to the afterlife, if you like, of the work. The other thing about it is he's a very clever marketing man, brilliant at self-promotion fusely. And after having created this, he didn't stop painting horrific pictures. He painted more and more horrific pictures, as it were. You know, he'd found his groove and we get amazing paintings of witchcraft, of child sacrifice, highly eroticized images of different sorts as well. And so he was building his reputation on the back of this. And that stayed, you know, as the master of the macabre. And as well as that sort of great literary background to its creation, there's also a great literary legacy, isn't there, in the sense that, isn't it right that Mary Shelley knew of this painting, may have included it in Frankenstein, Edgar Allan Poe and so on, you know, it's an image of horror for the ages. In it way. is, it is. It's sort of tapped into the, the zeitgeist of the, the late 18th century. Yes, it's almost certain that Mary Shelley did know it. I mean, Frankenstein comes later. That's published in, I think it's uh, 1818, something like that. But it's this type of imagery that must have been in the back of her mind when she's sort of sending the, the story of horror off in new, deeply disturbing directions. So yes, it does become part of the, the wide discourse around dark subject matter. And one can't really talk about it without talking about cartoons and caricature, because even in its own time, as it were, it was used as the basis of great caricatures. And I'm sure I'm not wrong in thinking I've seen versions of this in newspapers in the last decade or so. Absolutely. I mean, there are innumerable versions of it. It's a measure of how powerful an image it is, that it can lend itself to very serious reinterpretations, but also utterly frivolous, mischievous, misleading, sometimes political interpretations as well. And it does stay with us. There's a small number of paintings that actually one could say that about, but actually it really, really does stay with us. Not everybody knows who Fusli is, but most people will be able to summon up an image in their head of the nightmare. Well, Christopher, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. It's a pleasure. Thanks. Fusely, the realm of dreams and the fantastic, is at the Musée Jacquemart André in Paris until the 23rd of January 2023. And that's it for this episode. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Amy Dawson, Henrietta Bentel and David Clack. And David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Desmond, Lisa and Christopher. And thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.